This morning, I am going to visit with you a little bit about spiritual formation. That will probably not surprise a lot of you. We're going to talk about spiritual formation, and I'm going to use a metaphor, actually the most common metaphor in Scripture for the spiritual life, and that is a journey, the spiritual journey. But before I do that, let me tell you just a quick little story from my own little travel journal. <laughs> Um, when I graduated from college, all I could think about was seeing the world. I wanted to see the whole world. I wanted to travel everywhere. I loved the food and the, and the different languages and the different people and the different things. So anyway, I went straight from college to Kobe, Japan. Uh, had a professor actually suggest that I choose the destination, which I had, I had some like options that I could do. Um, to choose the destination that was the most unlike the place where I grew up, Casper, Wyoming. And I thought, okay, Japan. Sounds about as unlike that as possible. So I went there, I was there for a couple of years. I had a wonderful time in Kobe. And I moved from Kobe then to Budapest, Hungary. And I lived there for a year. I taught English in a middle school there in Budapest. And I have to say uh, that to this day, Budapest is maybe my very favorite city in the world. It'd be in the top three for absolute sure. I love Budapest. It is a beautiful, ancient city. The architecture is amazing. Thank goodness it, all of this beautiful architecture wasn't destroyed you know, during the many wars that have taken place there. Because it's right there in the middle of Europe, it has a long and a war-torn history that makes for some really cool stories kind of attached to it and attached to the architecture as you walk around town. I highly recommend it. If you have any way to possibly get to Budapest, I would take the opportunity to do it. It's a lovely place. One night I was there, when I was there, I was out with friends um, and I stayed out maybe just a little bit too late out with my friends, goes downtown Budapest, having a, just a good old time. And I was on my way home back to my apartment, which was kind of out in the farther reaches of the city on public transport. And um, I was on a tram at the moment, and I remember I was watching the stations really carefully, like, like paying real close attention to where I was, because I didn't know this part of the city at all. It was a very unfamiliar part of the city. And then I had to change. I had several stops to go, then I had to change to another line to get to on another little smaller kind of tram to get into my neighborhood to where I could walk home. And then all of a sudden, next thing that happens, my tram pulls up to the next station and stops, and everybody on the tram got off, and nobody got back on, and the tram didn't move. It just sat there, the doors wide open. And I'm like, oh no, what just happened? It was kind of surreal. And it's not just that everybody got off, but they disappeared into the night. I was just sitting there by myself for a couple minutes. Finally, I stepped down onto the platform and I'm, I looked around and there was fortunately an attendant there who could explain to me that at a certain time of the night, public transport in Budapest just shuts down. I imagine it does that in all the big cities, but I didn't know that. And so, unfortunately, I just sort of stood there discombobulated and then I did the only thing I could possibly do. I started walking. This is before cell phones. I didn't have a cell phone. I didn't have Google Maps. You know, I didn't have any of that kind of stuff. This is a long time ago. I'm dating myself here, but I couldn't call anybody. I had no way of getting any sort of help. And so I just started walking and I was praying and I was hoping that around every corner I would just see some landmark that I recognized, you know, so that I would know where I am and how to get home from there. After about 30, 45 minutes of wandering around in this, the kind of far reaches of Budapest, I did. I happened upon a monument, and I'm like, okay, I know my way home from here. Another 25, 30 minutes of walking, and I was home. And I need to say, in that moment, my homely little teacher's hostel, where I lived when I was there, was the most beautiful building in Budapest. <laughs> it was good to be home. <clears throat> now, uh, I'm gonna give you a minute to think back through your story, to think back through the journey that has brought you to this place. Can you find a time in your story when you felt lost, alone, cold?
cold, afraid, not knowing what you might find around the next corner, not knowing how you ended up there, kind of dumped out on a street corner in the darkness of Budapest at two in the morning. Maybe it was because of your own silly decisions, like mine was on that night. Or maybe it's from no fault of your own. I'll run you through some of the usual scenarios. You lost that job. The job that defined you. The job by which you understood yourself. The, the job by which you introduced yourself at parties and in public. And, that, and now that job is gone. Or maybe it was the loss of a loved one who literally helped define you, to make you who you are, led you, guided you, accompanied you in this life, and that loved one is gone. These are moments that can be discombobulating. They can be disorienting. Maybe it's that silence that you hear in the kitchen late at night after your, your baby, your youngest, has gone off to college, and you've got an empty nest now. But there are junctures in life where we just don't know where to go, how to proceed. We just know that we can't stand here on a darkened street corner. We've got to start walking. We've got to keep moving. So today, I want to talk about the spiritual journey and how sometimes we can get there on our spiritual journey and how we can find our way. I'm going to use an Old Testament story that I think you'll find familiar. We're going to talk about a guy named Abraham who was on a journey. If you'd like to turn in your Bibles, I'm going to be in Genesis chapter 12. Abraham, one of the more famous characters in the Old Testament. I'm going to guess that you heard about him before you came in here today. Abraham, and in this uh, text of scripture, don't let it throw you, but his name is Abram in this text of scripture. This is before his name later in his life was changed to Abraham. We're going to read from Genesis chapter 12. I'll start reading with verse one. The Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Verse 4 is not on your screen, but I'm going to read it so that you can know how Abram responded to this invitation. Verse 4 says, So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him, Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. So I'm going to make four quick observations about our story with Abraham. And then I'm going to come back around and talk about how these four things can be applied to our lives, can help us find our way in our journey. The first quick observation is that God invites God invited Abram on this, uh, on this journey. God initiates the conversation. Genesis is written in narrative form. It's a story. There's a storyteller, a narrator, a narrator who's telling a story. This part of the story is in quotes, so you know that this is a dialogue. But if you look really closely, you'll see it's actually sort of a monologue because Abram doesn't even have any lines here. God is speaking. And Abram's obedience is literally narrated into the story. So Abram went. God initiates, God invites Abram into a relationship. And then we find that if we uh, look back at the end of chapter 11, what we find is that Abram has actually been on a journey long before this was written. Abraham's already on a journey. He has been called already to the land of Canaan. And he, with his family, <clears throat> was already on the way there. His father, Terah, his wife, Sarai, the clan, the, the people that they were traveling with, the group that they were traveling with, they had already set out. And they had arrived in a city called Haran. 
and somehow they got waylaid there. We don't hear the details of that story, but at the end of chapter 11, we find that they settled there in Haran on their way to Canaan. We don't know how long they were there, and then Terah died. Abram's father passed away, and Abram there, maybe in his grief, maybe in his um, heartache, and maybe in a moment, like those moments we're talking about where he felt a little discombobulated, he felt a little disoriented, this kind of repetition of this invitation comes back to him. Go, go, go. I want you to go. And when God heard, when, when Abram heard God speak and invite him on this journey, he realized as journeys go that he was gonna want to be traveling light. So there are things that Abram had to leave behind. This is my second observation. Abram had to leave. God said, go out from his country, his people, and his father's house. His country, his inheritance, his ancestral lands, the very territory, the earthly space to which his family had been connected, we don't know for how many generations. Everything that is familiar. I once had a, some friends over for a family dinner, and I love, if you've ever been to my house for a family dinner, then you've probably had the dinner question. I like to throw a question out on the table and then go around the table, let everybody answer the same question. Not very long ago, <clears throat> I asked the question, tell us about your hometown where you grew up, and if you could take us on a journey back to your hometown as it was when you were a child, what are the places that you would show us in your hometown? We talked all night about that question. People love telling the stories of their hometown. Abram was asked to leave everything that was familiar to him. His people, think ancient people, clan, tribe, the people who gave him his name, the people who gave him his reputation. This was his support system, his father's house. Because his father, Terah, had recently passed away, Abram would have been expected to take over headship or leadership of this family. This is his role, his duty, his responsibility, his title, his authority. See how this whole package, when you put it all together, is Abram's entire identity? God is saying, not just go. Go out from, it's strong language, get out of there. And I want you to go to the land that I will show you. Third observation is he doesn't know the destination and he doesn't know the way. Abram is like, okay, well, I, what if I leave all this behind? Where are you taking me? I'll show you. How long is it gonna take to get there? I'll show you. It sounds really dangerous. How do I keep all these people safe? I'll show you. I will show you the destination and I will show you the way. I'll show you means that God is relational. It means that God is with him in the moment, that God's gonna be with him when he arrives, and God is gonna be with him every step of the way in between. I'll show you. Finally, there's this. God goes on to tell Abram what he will receive or what he will gain if in obedience he follows God on this journey, if he trusts him with his journey. There were three things that he had to leave behind. There are seven elements to the promises that he will receive. I'm gonna make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all the peoples of the earth will be blessed by you. Final observation, I told you they would be quick. Abram is richly blessed. He's richly blessed. Now, I'm gonna say something that I don't think I probably need to say here, but I'm gonna go ahead and say it anyway. The word blessed, when it's used in scripture, doesn't mean wealthy. It doesn't mean that if we trust God and follow Jesus, we'll be rich, or we'll have all the benefits of creature comforts. 
There are places actually that teach this. We call it a prosperity gospel, but our church is not one of them. That hasn't been our experience either, that when we are always obedient, that we, that we suddenly become healthy, wealthy, and have all of those benefits. In fact, Jesus absolutely guaranteed his followers that they would struggle, 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 that they would be disoriented, that they would be discombobulated from time to time, that they would mess up, and that they would find themselves lost from time to time. All right. So now let me turn it around. We're gonna walk back through those four things. We're gonna talk about what does this have to do with our journey, with our journey of formation. Spiritual formation, a quick definition, is that it is a process of being transformed into the likeness of Christ. It's a process of changing, we change from the person we used to be to the person we are becoming, the person God wants us to be by the power of the Holy Spirit. God is calling us. He's inviting us to this journey of transformation, of change. It is a uniquely human capacity, and according to the New Testament, it is our destiny that we be changed transformed into the likeness of Christ. Abraham is just one. I had so many to choose from. That was one of the hardest parts of this message, is choosing which journey story I was gonna tell this morning, because the Bible is full of stories of pilgrimage and journey, this, uh, of, of different people signing up and setting out on this journey of transformation. Just like Abraham was invited by God to go on this journey, so we are invited. God initiates. We sometimes start to think that we are in charge of our relationship with God and that we decide um, when things begin and where things go and that we're in, we have this inflated idea of our role in all of this. And yes, we do have choices to make. Yes, we do choose. We can follow God or not follow God. We can stay put in Haran and think, I like it here. I'm just gonna stay right here. I, I think this is fine for me. And we can reject the invitation that God has for us. But it's God who invites. It's a monologue on his part. We can receive that invitation or reject it. And then when we do receive it, when we put one foot in front of the other and we begin to walk, one of the first things we figure out is that we're already in a process of transformation. It started long ago. There's no such thing as not being on a journey. There's no such thing as not being formed. Um, in his book, it kind of served as a bit of inspiration for this message. The title of the book is Invitation to a Journey. The author, Robert Mulholland, says it like this. Everyone is in a process of spiritual formation. Every thought we hold, every decision we make, every action we take, every emotion we allow to shape our behavior, every response we make to the world around us, every relationship we enter into, every reaction we have toward the things that surround us and impinge upon our lives, all of these things, little by little, are shaping us into some kind of being. Our culture is in the business of shaping us. So whether it is the book you're currently into or the TV series you're hooked on at the moment, or the 24-hour news cycle, whatever you allow access to your mind is shaping you. You're already on the journey. God's invitation is to be shaped into the image of his son. And the invitation is always on the table. So maybe you have not decided what to do with Jesus. Maybe you've not decided what to do with this invitation. 
you don't trust him, you don't follow him. Maybe you're here this morning just because you're kicking tires and you're wondering about it. If that's the case, I am so grateful to you for being with us this morning. But whether that's the case or whether you're already, you've chosen to follow Jesus and you're on this journey, the invitation remains there. And there's this always this deeper invitation that's available to us. There are always new yeses to say to God and where he is taking us. Formation is underway. Also, just like Abraham, if we go on this journey, as pilgrims quickly learn, we want to travel light. There are things that we'll want to consider leaving behind. Abram was asked to go out from his country, his people, and his father's house, his whole identity. And I should tell you that our invitation is going to be no less costly. This pilgrimage, this uh, journey that we are going on will be an exercise in sort of releasing our own agendas, our own plans, our own goals for life. Uh, Dallas Willard referred to this as our little kingdoms. We have to leave those behind in order to enter into the beautiful country of God's kingdom, the, the kingdom that Jesus is inviting us to enter into. But if we go there, we're just not in charge. That's one of the agreements that we make. Jesus said when he was preaching the Sermon on the Mount, he said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all this other stuff, the stuff that we worry about, the stuff we concern ourselves with, the stuff we pay bills for, the stuff that we, that kind of we think is gonna define us, all of these things will be added to you as well. He's going to be sure that we have everything we need. In the same sermon, he said, anyone who seeks and everyone who seeks finds Third observation, like Abraham, we are following a voice. We don't know the way. We, we, may, we have a general idea of the destination because we've heard that we're supposed to end up like Christ, but that's not gonna be till the other side of eternity. From now till then, we're on a journey. We are following a voice. And this is where I think actually the ministry of spiritual formation really, really plays an important role. There's a little thing called discernment. We sometimes talk about it as discernment in spiritual formation. It's the capacity, the ability to hear and to discern the voice of God, to hear that voice, to know it from all the other voices, you know, that are calling us here and there and everywhere. You can learn this. It's a learned skill to hear the voice of God. It doesn't mean that you'll never get disoriented or discombobulated. It doesn't mean that you'll never completely mess up and end up on a dark road somewhere that you didn't plan to be in. But it does mean that the Holy Spirit is with us and is always calling us, always talking to us, and is helping us know which way to go. Let me just say that if you would have been able, if you would have been in Budapest and you could have told my 24 year old self that I would one day hold in the palm of my hand a little device that I could speak into and get walking directions to pretty much anywhere in the world, I would not have believed you. But I want to assure you that you can learn to hear God's voice, to follow God. If you are ready to listen, he is ready to speak. And then we just start walking and we just start moving. And it's on the way that we're transformed from the people we used to be to the people that we are becoming by God's grace. As we enter into this journey, 
we find that our, uh, when I say transformation, I mean that our character is changing. The, the core, the foundational core of our identity, who we actually are, and it changes. Uh, Eugene Peterson, uh, he's a late uh, pastor, he passed away several years ago, and a scholar, the man who paraphrased the whole Bible into what we call the message, um, he made this helpful distinction between tourists and pilgrims. There's a great market for religious experience in our world, but there's little enthusiasm for the patient acquisition of virtue. Little inclination to sign up for a long apprenticeship in what earlier generations of Christians called holiness. When we agree to follow God on this journey, we put one foot in front of the other and we set out. And from there, we simply follow Jesus. The main theme of this chapter 12 of Genesis when I read through it, you heard the word over and over again, blessed, 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 you're gonna be a blessing. And that's the final benefit of following Jesus. The blessings are very real. It was 1,600-ish years after Abraham walked through the land of Canaan that Jesus of Nazareth showed up on the same scene. And Jesus came, and according to Matthew chapter five, he went up on a mountain and he began to preach, and the very first words out of his mouth were, you are blessed. You are happy, you are fortunate, you are lucky, because you're invited into this kingdom of God. And he continued through the rest of that sermon to shape a beautiful picture of God's kingdom. And then later, at the end of his life, when he was getting ready to leave the disciples and trying to explain that to them, he explained to a very distraught group of disciples, I'm the way and the truth and the life if you know Jesus, then you know the way. You know the way to where you're going. He explained that to doubting Thomas there in that room. If we want then to have a relationship with our creator, the perfect heavenly father, the one who made us, who calls us, who gives us a role to play in his kingdom, then we go the way of Jesus. I am the way. Let me read to you from John chapter one. Um, I'm gonna start reading with verse 35. Uh, this is the gospel of John, and he's talking about John the Baptist when he says, the following day, John was again standing with two of his disciples. As Jesus walked by, John looked at him and declared, look, there's the Lamb of God. When John's two disciples heard this, they followed Jesus. And Jesus looked around and he saw them following. And he said, what do you want? Or in a translation that I like even better, what are you seeking? They replied, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Jesus said, come and see. Come and see. And whenever he asked people to be his disciples, he used language like that. Follow me, come and see. We're moving, just start walking. Just start moving, don't stay here. Don't get stuck in your grief. Don't get stuck in Haran. Don't get stuck wherever you are. But instead, we're on the move. We're on a journey. This is a, a pilgrimage, an internal pilgrimage that results in our transformation into the likeness of Christ. At Crossings, we have a lot of opportunities. We, offer, we wanna offer you as many sort of 
little gates into this narrow way as we possibly can. So you'll see classes and groups and many opportunities to enter into this way of following Jesus. As a matter of fact, this fall, we're designing a class called The Way that's specifically designed around these spiritual practices that will help you get started on this journey or take a new leg of the journey of following Jesus. And I'd like you to consider the invitation. In fact, if you don't mind, would you go ahead and stand with me here today? If you are able, please stand. And I'm gonna say a prayer. And I'd like you to think about where you're at on the journey at this moment. What does this invitation look like for you personally? Because God's voice to each one of us is very, very intimate and personal. And his invitation for each of us is gonna look a little bit different. But his invitation is always to follow him. Heavenly Father, as God told Abraham to go, to detach from his own contrived identity, we know that the Spirit is always with us on this same journey, giving us directions, giving us guidance, telling us to turn left or right or what to do. And we know that Jesus is the way. So I ask God that you would be with each one of us in this room, that we would hear this invitation for ourselves, know the sound of your voice, and be courageous enough to join you on the journey and it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. God bless.